So um, the main characters in my talk will be the permutation classes. So we'll need to start with a few definitions and I'll start slowly with permutations. I'm sure you know a permutation of size n is a bijection from the integers from 1 to n to itself. And you can draw or represent or write a permutations in many ways. So one would be you list the integer from 1 to n and below you list their images over there. But the first line really doesn't bring much information, so you can drop it. And that would be the word representing a permutation. And this is a way of writing a permutation that will be, well, that will appear in several places in the talk. If you like algebra, you probably like to decompose permutation as a product of cycles. I won't do that. So if you do, please put that aside for the next hour. And if you like pictures, like I do, you will like to draw permutations, or if you prefer, that's the permutation matrix associated with it, except that instead of zeros, I have empty cells, and instead of ones, I have dots. So I would have a dot in column i at ordinate sigma of i. So one one is there in that corner, which is not usual for a permutation matrix, but for me it will be. So now, well, to get to permutation classes, I need to speak about permutation patterns. So I thought it would be nice for you to know about the history of that notion, permutation patterns. So here it is. Imagine you have a sequence of numbers. Here it's a permutation, but it doesn't have to be as long as your numbers are distinct. I'm happy. And you have a stack which you require to satisfy the Hanoi condition which, well, may, sometimes it's called like that. So you want your numbers to be incre increasing from uh, bottom to top. That's a little picture. And you'll try to sort your sequence using your stack. So you push elements, well, you push six. One can go on top without violating the condition in the stack, so you do that. But to push three, you need to pop the one, so you do that. Here you can pop two, and to, sorry, you can push two. And to push seven, you need to pop everything because seven is too large to sit on top of any of those. So you pop, push, and you can push five and four, pop the whole thing, and get another sequence of numbers. So in that case, it's not sorted. I have six, which is not where it should be. But nevertheless, I've defined an operator that takes a sequence of numbers or a permutation and transform it into another sequence or another permutation. If this, this algorithmic presentation is not your cup of tea, you can see that it's not hard to define the same operation recursively by splitting your sequence around the maximum and applying the operator on the left part, on the right part, and putting the maximum at the end. So if you prefer that definition, that's completely equivalent. All right, so now the question you can ask is, what can I sort with that? For which permutations do, will I obtain an increasing sequence as output? And Knuth uh, answered that question in the late 60s. Sorry, yes, 60s. A permutation is sortable using a stack if and only if it avoids the pattern 231. Here are the patterns. What does it mean? It means that your permutation should not contain three elements appearing in the order sigma i, sigma j, sigma k in my word notation, such that those condition holds, meaning that uh, sigma i should be the second largest, sigma j the third largest, and sigma k the smallest. So the pattern 231 is yeah, the fact that you have three elements whose relative comparison are the same as those in 231. Right, roughly speaking. So that's how the interest in permutation, permutation patterns started. And shortly after that first result of Knuth, several people have um, studied other sorting devices using stacks and queues and mixing all that and try to say, what can you sort with them using patterns? 
those results are more complicated and less precise in general. But yeah, that's how the theory started. Sorting, sorting procedure won't appear anywhere else in my talk, but now you know where it comes from. So you have seen the definition of patterns on an example now, but in general, I will say that a permutation pi of size k is a pattern of a larger permutation sigma of size n. If in my sigma, I can find a subsequence of size k whose element compare in the same way as they do in pi. And if that happens, pi is a pattern of sigma, and I write it with this curly less than symbol. So if you prefer, you can say that when you take your subsequence and you normalize it on the values from 1 to k, replacing the smallest by 1, the second smallest by 2, etc., etc., you get exactly your pattern pi. So an example is there. If I look at that sigma and the subsequent 3, 1, 5, 7, this is an occurrence of the pattern 2, 1, 3, 4, since, well, the second of the elements I picked is the smallest, the first is the second smallest, etc., etc. And I like to view patterns on the diagrams of permutations because it makes it really clear what it is if it were not already. So to see a pattern in that permutation, I pick some elements, remove the others, remove the empty lines and columns, and I get my pattern. And the key remark about that pattern thing is that it's a partial order on the set of all permutations. It's really not hard to see, but it's really a powerful remark because it brings to the definition of permutation classes that I will give you in a moment, which have a very rich combinatorics that I want to illustrate in the first part of this talk. So I'm not the only person who thinks that. Even the early people working on permutation patterns were aware of it, although most of the research started a bit earlier, a bit later, sorry. So what is a permutation class? Oh, wait, uh, are there questions that you need to ask before I continue? If any, please feel free to interrupt. I prefer to say less, but you to understand. You mentioned the, the new pattern that's forbidden 2, 3, 1. Is it, it's to the middle element? Uh, it's the middle in terms of value. Okay. Two is the middle element in terms of value, but it has to sit as a first one when you read from left to right. What if there's an even number of elements? I don't really care about the That's number of <laughs> elements being even or odd. Uh, why, why, why does it bother you? Well, then the, then, then well, if I have one, two, three, four, I have the first, the, the smallest value, the second smallest value, the fourth, the third value, and the fourth value, and that I don't have a notion of middle element, but but I can still do something like that, right? Okay, so if uh, the notion of patterns is clear, a permutation class is easy to define. It's just a um, set of permutation that is downward closed for my pattern order, or that's an ideal if you prefer. The, anyway, the condition is that when you take a permutation in your class and a pattern of it, then the pattern has to be in the class. So if this is meant to represent the poset of all permutations with the arrows indicating who is a pattern in who, and if that blue 1423 is in my class C, then everything that is below it becomes blue. That is, it, it's also in C. It has to be. So, in general, if I want to view a permutation class in that poset, oh, you distinguish red and blue. So the blue part should be my class, and the red part is what is outside. I take my cone and I remove some cones, possibly an infinite number, that I tell you. And um, at the bottom of those cones, I have those red dots, which forms what is called the basis of a class. So for that, I need a few notation. If I fix a given pattern pi, AV of pi is the set of permutation that avoid pi. So they do not contain pi 
they don't have any occurrence of that pattern. If I want a v of b for a set b, I take the permutation that of all old patterns in my set b. And you can always represent a permutation class um, as the set of permutation that avoids a given thing. That thing is the set of red elements that were in my picture earlier, and it's called the basis of the class. Uh, it, it is formed of the minimal elements that are not in the class for the pattern relation, and it's always an anti-chain. So that's a canonical way of giving a permutation class. And what I was saying is, because there are infinite anti-chains in the permutation pattern post sets, you may have classes with infinite bases. And this is puzzling, especially to people who do graph minor theory. So that happens in our case, whereas when you take minor closed graph classes, they always have finite bases. And that's a very important difference between the two fields, which do share some similarities, but <laughs> not that one. All right. So here were the main guys for my talk. And I'd like to tell you a bit what people like to study about them. That's my point of view. My apologies to anyone who likes a topic in that field which is not listed. So the historical thing was to enumerate specific classes. That is, you fix a permutation class C and you wonder how many permutations of size N there are in C for any N. If you want, you can encapsulate all that information in the generating function. So start slowly with just one excluded patterns. Well, of size two, you really won't do much. So let's start with size three. And if, if you think of the diagram representing permutation, and if you make all symmetries of the square, you will notice that for bidding a pattern of size three, you just have two cases, a monotone pattern or one that is not monotone. And you can always get, well, to, well, and it would be always equivalent to study the avoidance of 231 or, of, sorry, 231 or 321 for that reason. So permutations in those classes have been described in ancient times and by Knuth, the way I showed you earlier. The enumeration is known. Both uh, classes will give you the catenal sequence. There exist bijections between them. This is a survey where you will find what, a, a small dozen of bijections, I think. And despite those three points which make the class look similar, there are very deep differences between the two, and I'll illustrate that on two occasions later in the talk. Okay, you can keep going and forbid one pattern of size four, not just for symmetries, also for more complicated reason. You can see that you have just three sequences that arise in that case. Classes enumerated by these three sequences, sequences are given there. The first one has an algebraic but not rational generating function. This was a definite, not algebraic generating function. And this one isn't enumerated. It's conjectured to have a non-definite generating function. Uh, well, it's open. Although it seems a very simple problem. So that's not, a, that's not an easy field. Okay, so you can keep going and systematically enumerate classes with small bases consisting of small patterns. That was uh, very popular in the 90s and there were many results from that time. Nowadays, there were a few new methods that have been developed in the last decade maybe and that have allowed to solve other specific, the enumeration of other classes. Well, I'll talk about one method in that talk uh, and briefly mention a couple of others. So this line of research has regained some interest. And you do not only enumerate permutation classes because you like to do that. Sometimes you do it because 
a permutation class can appear in another context. Maybe, so one context I know is that there is a permutation class with a basis consisting of maybe six or seven elements of size up to six that are the indices of some family of Schubert varieties. And people studying those objects were interested to know how many they are. And using those techniques that I was mentioning, that class was also enumerated. So you can have uh, enumeration questions of those objects that arise for, for other reasons. All right, so that's the historical uh, line of research on permutation classes. Another one, still about the enumeration, is not to enumerate the class exactly, but to measure how fast it grows. And for this, you would like for this you would like to define uh, the growth rate to be the nth root of the number of permutations of size n in your class, but you don't know whether that limit exists, so you will take the soup and the inf, defining the upper and lower growth rate. And it was conjecture is is now a theorem that uh, those, well, the growth rate, let's say the upper growth rates, are finite as soon as you take a proper class, that is to say, a class that is not the whole set of permutations. So, in other words, for any class, there is a C such that you have no more than C to the N permutations in your class. So, it's a really a small set. Okay. So, as I was telling you, what people would like to do is to define the growth rate, not the upper and the lower one. And indeed, it's conjecture that those two value coincide, the upper and the lower one, and that you would define, would define the growth rate of the class. It's known that it exists in some cases. Whenever you forbid a single pattern, then you know the class has a growth rate. It holds also, and actually that's a superset, when C is what is called sum close or skews close, so that covers more classes but in general it's not known. Now, how large can those growth rates be? If I look at uh, principal classes. So what is uh, proved, what is known since a long time, is that if you forbid the decreasing pattern of size k, then the growth, growth rate which exists is equal to k minus one squared. And it was conjectured that this is the, the uh, largest you can get. This was called Arasia's conjectures, and it's false. So, for several reasons, and it's... The first proof is just a counterexample to the conjecture, given by this fam famous class avoiding one patterns of size four that you don't know how to enumerate. You know, well, those guys have proved that the growth rate is strictly larger than nine. While I'm there, now we have a better lower bound and the best current, best upper bound is far from coinciding with it. The conjecture is that it would be 11.6. But still, after those work, people were thinking, okay, Maybe it's not k minus one squared, but it's quadratic in k, we're just missing some factor. Or it's a polynomial in k, we just don't know the degree. Actually, all this is false, and this um, follows from a result of Fox, which apparently has been a preprint for two and something years, but that typically the growth rate of a principal class will be exponential in the size of the excluded pattern. That's a result from extremal combinatorics, which is, was very surprising and beautiful. Okay, so one more thing about growth rates. Now you can wonder which numbers can be growth rates of classes. And this is not completely known, but quite well understood for the moment. So when you take a large growth rate after that value lambda, you know that every real number is a growth rate of a class. And for the smaller ones, they are very well understood until some value, 
which is an algebraic number that is characterized by an explicit polynomial, not of big degree, something simple. Before that, you know that there are countably many growth rates. You know how they accumulate in accumulation points. That's a very nice picture that uh, Vince Vater would show you. However, there is a little gap between the two where you absolutely don't know what happens. So. All right, still speaking about enumeration, instead of looking at how fast a permutation class grows, you can ask, okay, I look at the generating function, and is it nice? Is it rational or algebraic? Or, okay, I would be happy with definite. Could it be non-definite? And already with the first cases of AV231, AV321, you have interesting behavior there. So those classes are enumerated by the Catalan number, meaning the generating function will be algebraic in that case. But if you restrict to subclasses of them, so you forbid additional patterns, in AV231, you will always find a rational generating function if you do that. In AV321, you may find non-definite generating functions for subclasses. But, so that's one of the differences I was mentioning earlier. But you can weaken somehow this difference by proving that if you take a special subclass of AV321, which, is I, which either has finite basis or is well quasi-ordered, I'll, I'll say what this is in a minute, then the generating function is also rational. And this uh, well quasi-ordered thing is also related in another way with the um, niceness of the generating function. So um, you will say that a permutation class is well quasi-ordered Sometimes you find weight well partially ordered if uh, you have no infinite antichain in your class. And also no infinite descending chain, but that's never the case in the permutation pattern poset because you always reach the bottom of my cone. So a theorem is that if a class and all the subclasses are algebraic, then your class will be uh, WQO. And well, it's conjectured that the converse also holds. So you would have a tight connection between being WQO and having being nice from the nature of the generating function point of view. Another uh, statement to which I will return later on is a sufficient condition for the generating function to be algebraic which is the fact that the class contains finitely many simple permutations. I'll define also that adjective later. All right, so right, that shows that, well, you have a variety of behaviors for the generating functions and you can say general things about nice behaviors in terms of the nature of the generating function. I think I'm done with the overview of enumeration results that I wanted to do but I want to say a few words about probability theory on permutation classes as well. So that's a more recent research area. So let's say you pick a permutation class and you wonder, okay, what does a large object in my class taken uniformly at random look like? And convenient way of asking that question is what the diagram, what does the diagram look like? Because that's a where you can represent what you see. And here are answers, not, not by me, that you can find in these papers, for uh, classes that avoid a given pattern of size 3. And, okay, here you see again that these classes are similar in some sense, that okay, you, will, you see a main diagonal appearing, but not in the same way, so they are really also different, those two classes. So the results that people have proved on those objects is for the first column of my pictures, you, what is uh, described in the papers is a very precise but local description of the shape you see in the picture. In the second column, the convergence to one, the main diagonal is proved and also the fluctuations around the main diagonal is studied. 
And there is a third family of results, which at the moment you don't see why it's related to the shape of the diagram you see, but it is, and that will be a bit clearer later on. So let's fix your class to be AV1332. And assume that, well, and assume, what is known is that for any pattern pi, this quantity converges in distribution to a strictly positive random variable. This quantity being the number of occurrences of your pattern in AV, in your, permut in your random uniform permutation in that class, divided by the size of the big permutation to some power, which depends not only on depend on, not only on uh, the size of your pattern, but properties of it, how many decents it has. All right. um, beyond those classes of forbidding a pattern of size 3, not much is known. There is a result in David Beaven thesis that um, describes the limit shape of a family of classes that are the connected monotone grid classes. And there is some work that we have done recently that describes the limit shift of the separable permutations of which I'll tell a word at the end. The nice thing is that this case is the first case where you find a non-deterministic limit for your object. So, before I get to substitution decompositions, which is the other keyword of my talk, I want to tell you that the results that I've presented briefly is, or, well, are, do not all follow from the general approach, but they've in, whenever you want to prove a result that applies to many classes, like uh, what I was saying about the growth rates, or the nature of the generating function. You need generic tools to handle those generic permutation classes you are talking about. And there are quite a few general methods for that. So the generating trees are from the 90s and they're really uh, suited for enumerations. That, that Maybe that's a different story, but all those are much more recent. That includes the substitution decomposition and I'll, I'll talk about that more. If you're interested to learn more about those, you can have a look at Vince Vader's survey in the Handbook of Enumerative Combinatorics edited by Miklos Bona. Uh, it's, it's a very good reading. About those methods, they are used, as I said, to prove general results, but not only. They can also help enumerating specific classes. And for the Schubert variety thing that I was mentioning earlier, those method, methods have been used. So, well, that shows their interest even more, if there would be need. All right. So I'm about to start the substitution decomposition. And um, for that, let me define an operation that I call the substitution or inflation sometime you can find, that builds big permutation from smaller ones, briefly speaking. So if, uh, if you give me a permutation pi and, two, and a sequence of k permutation, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha k, k being the size of pi, the substitution, which I denote by the square brackets like that, will give me a permutation sigma that I obtained as follows, with pictures. And an example. I'll take my pi here to be 1, 3, 2. And the diagram of pi is 1, 3, 2 there. So I need three alphas. I take those. And to uh, obtain the sigma, I just replace the first point from left to right by the diagram of alpha 1, the second point by the diagram of alpha 2, the third point by the diagram of alpha 3, and with this set of points drawn in the plane, I stretch my axis a little so that I get the diagram of a permutation, and that's the result of the substitution. So in general, oops, yes, you can, if you focus on your sigma and you say, how can I obtain it as a substitution? There are many ways of doing that, but there is one canonical way that is given by the substitution decomposition theorem I'll tell you later. But to define that, I need to tell you what simple permutations are. So, 
Let's start with an interval in a permutation. That's uh, a set of elements that form an interval both for values and positions. So in other words, that's a set of points that form a square with no one on its uh, boundaries in my diagram. And a permutation is simple if it has no such interval except those of size one and the whole thing. So this permutation, for instance, is simple. You cannot find a set of points that is not separated either vertically or horizontally. And somehow, um, those simple permutations play the same role as the prime numbers in the decomposition of integers as product of primes. Like one is not prime, the permutation of size one is not simple. Then you have two simple permutations of size two. And actually that, that would, I mean, I don't want them, I don't want to consider those two simple. For my purposes, it will be nicer to say that simple start after, after once. If you look in size three, take any example, you will see that your permutation has an interval of size two. So you have no simple of size three, then you have two of size four, and this continues. If you want to know more about simple permutations, you can have a look in that paper. You'll see that the generating function is not definite, and that there are very many simple permutations, asymptotically factorial n over e squared. So that's definitely not a permutation class. All right. So I'm almost uh, done with notation to state, oh yes? It's uh, related to the Comte numbers. It's the inverse is explicit. The functional inverse is explicit, but the function is not quite, if I understand correctly. All right, so to state the theorem, uh, the substitution decomposition theorem there, I need a few more notation. When I substitute into an increasing sequence, I will replace the increasing sequence by a plus, and same with a minus for the decreasing case. And I will say that a permutation is plus in decomposable when I can write it, when I cannot write it as a substitution into plus. Same with minus. Now, if you take, so this uh, decomposition theorem gives you the canonical substitution that I was uh, mentioning earlier. If you take any permutation, it can be decomposed in a unique way in one of the following three ways. Either it's an inflation in a plus with the alpha i's that are plus in decomposable, or inflation in a minus with the alpha i minus in decomposable, or an inflation in a simple permutation pi with no condition on the alpha i's except that their numbers should coincide with the, side, the size of pi. And proving that is really not hard. <coughs> Essentially, the alpha i's just represent the maximal intervals that are in your permutation, that are not the permutation itself. But what you can do with the theorem is so interesting that it deserved its name. All right, so that's, if you want, the first step of decomposition, but now you can play the same game inside the alpha i's and decompose them recursively and record that in a tree, which is the decomposition tree. And here is an example of the decomposition tree of this permutation of size 21. So if you write the substitution that gives sigma, whose existence is uh, given by this theorem earlier, it, well, it look like, looks like it if you do it recursively. So it's a substitution in 3142, which is simple, and you put that at the root, and you will have four, sub yes, four subtrees, four being the size of this. That corresponds to alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, that you again decompose in the same way to obtain your tree. So what about those trees you obtained? They are rooted, of course. They are ordered or planed. You have a left to right order between your, the edges going out of a vertex. You never have a plus plus edge nor a minus minus edge because in my first two items, I had the plus in decomposable and minus in decomposable conditions. 
And actually, if you take all trees that satisfy this condition, it's always a decomposition tree. And you can take that as the definition of decomposition trees if you want. And what the substitution decomposition theorem is that you have a bijection between permutation and decomposition trees where the size is the number of leaves. And that's really good because you like trees, no? I mean, everyone does. And I like those words of Philippe Flagellet and Robert Sedgwick that, yeah, it conveys the idea that trees are really what you should work with. So let me focus on the trees and describe in a different way the substitution decomposition theorem that I was uh, telling you. It gives you a tree grammar that describes the set of all permutations. If I denote by capital S the set of all simple permutation, the substitution decomposition theorem tells me that any permutation is either a single point or it has a root, which can be plus, minus, or a simple thing, with below, well, indecomposable things, either plus indecomposable, minus indecomposable, or any permutation. And what I want to do from now is try and use this on permutation classes. So the question would be, I take this tree grammar that describes the set of all permutation and I will try to restrict it to a permutation class. If possible, I'd like to be able to do that automatically, maybe with an algorithm, maybe. And if I have this tree grammar that comes from a specialization of that, what can I deduce about my class from this grammar? And the rest of the talk is telling you why this is yes, 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 and nice results, hopefully. I, well, let's go and have a look. So, the starting point is this theorem of Albert and Atkinson that tells you, okay, oh, that's the sufficient uh, condition for having an algebraic generating function that appeared at the bottom of a slide earlier. So if you take a class C that you assume has finitely many simple permutations in it, then the class has a finite basis and an algebraic generating function. So I won't talk much about the finite basis part of the theorem, but how do you prove the algebraicity part? Actually, it's a constructive proof. You start from the tree grammar I was mentioning. You restrict it to your class. So first, instead of doing the sum on all simple permutations, you will do it on them in your class. The otherwise will never occur. So those equations are finite based on this assumption. And your class is defined now by some avoidance conditions. So you will put them in your grammar. And if you put them here, you will want to push them down in the subtrees. And if you push down your constraints, what you will get by not a miracle, but something I don't want to uh, describe in detail, is a tree grammar that describes your class. This tree grammar is not as nice as you wish because it can be ambiguous. So some permutations can be uh, can appear in several terms in an equation. But still, if you want to count how many there are, you can use the inclusion principle, transform your tree grammar into a polynomial system for your generating function. All right, so it's algebraic. And you can compute it on any given example by following the method described in the proof. What has come afterwards is this proof is constructive, but can you automat automatize the computation of the grammar? And maybe it would be better if you would be able to compute a grammar that is not ambiguous. Yes? So if, if you do that, if you just restrict the sum to S intersected with your class, you do get 
a system of equation for some class, but it might be bigger than the class you're looking at. For instance, if you take the AV231, you have no simple permutation, so you just drop those terms. But still, the class you get is that of separable permutation I'll talk about later, so it's larger. So if you want a uh, system for your class AV231, you'll need to push the avoidance of 231 inside. So 231, yes, if you have a plus node, then the first branch cannot contain something ex except a leaf, otherwise you would get, well, etc., etc. So it's not as simple as just restricting the last sum, but that's the first step. All right, so as I was saying, the, the next thing would be to try and compute the grammar the, automatically, at least as automatically as possible, and maybe have a non-ambiguous one so that you don't have redundancies and you can do random generations, in, random sampling in particular, which you cannot do whether you have something ambiguous. So here, is, here are the few steps for getting to an algorithm. Uh, finding those combinatorial specification. As an input, I will assume that my class is given by a finite basis. Anyway, the theorem of Albert and Atkinson tell me if I'm not in that case, I'm screwed. So that's a fair way of uh, giving my class to the program. First point is to tr test the condition of the theorem, having a finite number of simple permutations. So you can uh, try and count the simple permutation of size 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc., etc., in your class. And the result of Schmuel and Trotter will tell you if you find two consecutive numbers where it's zero, it will always be zero. So you know you will have a finite number. That's the most naive way of doing that. And, but that's not a decision procedure. You're never sure it will stop. Next, a decision procedure has been uh, given using automata theory techniques. And what we have done is modify that. Uh, well, it's not a straightforward modification. And um, this resulted in an algorithm that is, in Vince Vatter's word, much more practical, although it still has a high complexity. Uh, well, it's twice too exponential better than the decision procedure, but it's still high. Now, if you know the set of simple is finite, you want to compute it so that you can do the first step of uh, cutting down the last sum in your equations. So with the Schmel and Trotter thing, you can, you can find your set of simple the same way I told you earlier, but you can be cleverer and use the structure of the permutation pattern post set restricted to simple permutations. And that's a result of uh, Pierrot and Rossin that you have an algorithm computing that set of simples whose complexity is uh, controlled, at least. Now that you have the set of simple, you want to return to your tree grammar and specialize it to your class to have a non-ambiguous tree grammar. And there are two ways of doing that. One which is not quite effective, but is very, yeah, theoretically very nice to present using query complete set and the one which is closer to the objects, which can be algorithmized, when you really push your constraint in the subtrees and get rid of the ambiguities and keep going until you reach a combinatorial specification, then that's an algorithm we have um, given. Okay, so now that we are there, we have an algorithm, at least in if you believe me, that takes a finite basis and if the class has finitely many simple, will give you a combinatorial specification for the class. And from that, you can automatically have a random sampler using, for instance, Boltzmann model of permutations in your class. So you experiment with it and you plot diagrams of permutations in your classes. And those two pictures are diagrams of large separable permutations. So in the case of separable permutations, you don't need the algorithm to find the combinatorial specification. 
you have it, but you can do, you can play the same game in other classes. All right, and well, when you see pictures like that, you want to explain them. So, can we describe what the limit shape of a permutation in the class is? Limit shape in terms of their diagram seems the most natural way. And the answer is yes, we can. And here is how uh, it goes. So for the separable case for the moment, so that's just one specific permutation class, a very simple one. So let me define the quantity oc tilde of pi and sigma to be the number of occurrences of the pattern pi in a permutation sigma normalized by something well, which is the total possible number of occurrences of pi and sigma. So that's a bit similar to what Janssen was doing earlier in the talk, if you remember that slide. But the normalization is somehow more natural in our case. And if I denote by uh, a big sigma sub n, uh, random separable permutation, what we have proved is that there exists random variable lambda pi, pi ranging over all permutations, which are patterns, such that the number of occurrence of pi in sigma n converges in distribution to lambda pi. And those lambda pi's are actually probabilities. So they are between 0 and 1. So I won't try to give you an idea of the proof that was too ambitious for a talk today. But substitution decomposition, which is how we obtain the specification, is also key to proving the theorem. So that's the simplest way I can write the theorem, but it's actually richer. We do not only know the existence of the lambda pi, we know how to build them. We know that the convergence holds jointly for sequences of patterns. We know that the lambda pi's are not deterministic, except in the cases where they trivially are. And we know a combinatorial formula for the moments of lambda pi. So we know quite a lot more than what is written in the theorem. You may ask now, well, what about the diagrams? Good question. For that, I need to tell you what a permuton is. Formally speaking, it's a measure on the uni squared with uniform marginal both, both ways. But informally speaking, it's a diagram of a finite or an infinite permutation that you squeeze in the unit square. A bit like you were doing, Piotr, earlier with your young diagrams. And those guys have proved that, well, in a deterministic setting, but bringing that to a probabilistic setting is not, not much work, that if you know that the number of occurrences of pi and sigma for all pi converge to something, then you have the convergence of permutons, that is to say of the diagrams that represents your permutations. So another way using that of interpreting our theorem from the previous slide is that, okay, if I take uh, mu sigma n to represent the permuton associated to the random separable permutation, then it tends to mu in distribution for some random permuton mu. Mu is a mysterious object, although we do know something about it. We know that it's not deterministic. And somehow this explains why the two pictures of separable permutation that I showed you are not as similar as you would like them to be. After we have posted on the archive, Mikael Mazun worked on our work and has next given a construction of mu in the continuum and has proved properties of mu, like the Hausdorff dimension is one, da 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 da. He's there, so please ask him if you want to know more and he will be more able to answer. This last slide is about how, I mean, this was just about separable permutations, but it actually applies to more permutation classes 
that are substitution closed. So substitution closed just means closed when you do substitution. If you take pi and the alphas to be in your class and you do the substitution, you have to stay in your class. And now say you take a substitution closed class C, it's characterized by the set of permut simple permutations it contains. And assuming some conditions on that set of simple permutations from the enumeration point of view, then in a similar way, you can prove the convergence of the limit shapes of the diagrams of the permutations in your class towards a random permuton mu, with, well, mu c, which is not exactly the same mu of the separable case, but it's a one parameter deformation of it, which somehow will account for giving a more weight to the increasing or to, to the decreasing thing, which was uh, balanced in the separable case. All right, that's probably where I end, and thank you for listening. <laughs>